Many new fans of Oasis, when discovering the band for the first time, can be quite surprised when they listen first to the classic hits from the 90s and then to some of the slightly different material in the noughties, particularly things like Heathen Chemistry. To a first-time listener, they can literally sound like two different bands. Even Liam sounds like a different vocalist in the two different decades. Oasis in the 90s was their classic era, and it's when all their biggest hits were recorded. Oasis in the noughties was a time when many of us who grew up with them noticed that something really had changed, and the band wasn't quite the same anymore. This is called the force of nature. What are you cheering for? You haven't fucking heard it yet. But the biggest changes in the band were nothing to do with press, image or culture. It was something in the music that had shifted, so it didn't really hit you deeply in the same way anymore. So today, as a certified Oasis nerd, I'd like to go through 10 different reasons I think something changed between the 90s and the noughties in the career of Oasis. Noel Gallagher had a very rough childhood and a violent and abusive father, and there's probably some connection there with the fact that he ended up getting heavily into drug taking as a young teenager. All throughout the 1990s, during the Oasis heyday, Noel Gallagher was open about his drug use. He talked about it in the press, on the radio, even in the lyrics to his songs. You know, I was living in a plastic bag that was just full of fucking Charlie and booze for the last 14 years, really, if I'm being honest. And I started taking drugs when I was, you know, just left school. I thought, no, I don't know. However, in Detroit, in 1998, Noel's drug taking reached its apex. Noel had been awake and strung out on drugs for three nights in a row, and he had a psychotic episode and was hospitalised. During that time, there were several moments where he actually thought he was about to die and could feel what he believed was a heart attack coming on. Noel was having cocaine-induced panic attacks, and many of the songs he wrote on Standing on the Shoulder of Giants was specifically talking about this episode. Now, round about the time, in between the end of BA now and the beginning of this, right of this album, I went through a pretty dark time with drugs and stuff. Yeah. And I've since found that it's very, very easy to articulate darkness than it is to articulate, you know, happiness. Um, well, that's, you know, that, that's just, on this particular album, it's just, that, you know, they're just documents of what was going on in my life around about that time. In Go Let It Out, there's a line talking about sister psychosis. There's the uncharacteristically dark, where did it all go wrong? And of course, Gas Panic, which is written specifically about his breakdown and panic attacks at this time. Thankfully, Noel didn't die, but he was never quite the same again after his psychotic episode and breakdown, and that was probably for the best. He came off hard drugs, was put on antidepressants, and enforced a no drugs or alcohol in the studio policy within the band. And here began a new phase of life where he tried to stay clean and clear-headed, especially now that he had new responsibilities as a father. But Noel had been on drugs all throughout his teens and his twenties, and he had learned to write songs 
within that drug-soaked environment. And so, when his drug use eventually broke his mind, afterwards, his songwriting process, of course, changed. It wasn't that Noel wrote better songs while on drugs, not at all. The problem was he learned and developed his songwriting process while on drugs. So when he came off them and couldn't use them in that same way anymore, he kind of had to start again from scratch. And so, as the new Noel emerged from his psychotic episode, the band relocated to France to record their fourth studio album. But while there, a new tension emerged in the band between Noel and the two remaining founding members, Bonehead and Gwigsy. Liam was actually being quite supportive of Noel's drive to get clean, and he was inspired to also try and get off alcohol. And so, there was a no drink and no drugs policy in the studio during the making of Standing on the Shoulder of Giants. Guitarist Bonehead, however, was a very heavy drinker at this time, and was not willing to stop and he kept drinking in front of Liam. Now, there are numerous conflicting reports of how this all came to a head, but the one constant theme between them all seems to be that Bonehead, who ignored the rules and kept drinking, burst into someone's bedroom, pissed as a fart in the middle of the night, and tipped wine over either one of the band or crew. Of course, there was a massive row, after which Bonehead left. Gwigsy, who was dependent on weed, followed soon after, and Alan White, who had joined the band midway through the 90s, left after the following album. I always think back and think, well, we were in a massive chateau in the south of France. We're driving Aston Martins, we're doing this, that, and the other, and it's like, wow, you know, there shouldn't be any tension. That should have been the most fun a band's ever had. In the middle of all this, Liam was trying to kick the booze, and I was trying to kick the drugs, and all the lyrics on that album reflect that time really. There was a problem with Liam who's drinking too much, it's like, all right, so none of us will drink. It's been said that I drank too much while we were there. Of course I didn't. I'm a grown man, I'm gonna stop doing what I do. I'll okay it with the singer. Is it all right, Liam? We'll, we'll go up to his bar up hills. He drinks a Coke. Do you mind if I have a pint of lager, Liam? I am driving, so I'm not gonna get legless. Bono was just being a bit of an arsehole towards one of the people that was working with us. I thought he was being a bit out of order, to be honest. I decided in uh, a drunken state one night, to have it out with him, he took offence, said he was going back to England. I said, I'll call you a taxi. Never seen him since. That was it. He left, then Gwigs leaves, and that's it, so it's pretty much it's shit's creek. I remember that being a really, really, really good time. And then Bonin and Gwigs left, right out of the blue. Again, we're just back in the midst of chaos, you know? I can't really speak for Gwigs, but I think he was doing it for reasons similar to mine. I haven't spoken to either of them since the day they left. I sometimes sit down and think, well, they've spoken to everybody else. I mean, what did I do to them, you know? Especially in the case of Quiggs. I don't know why he left. I haven't got a clue. I don't know whether he's told anybody else, but nobody's telling me. And so, in the noughties, the two earliest members of the band were now gone. The drummer followed shortly afterwards. Some people could have looked at Oasis and said, it's not really a five-piece band anymore. It's just Noel, Liam and a backing band. But it wasn't just Bonehead and Gwigsy who moved on at this point. Alan McGee, owner of Creation Records to which Oasis were signed, also closed down his label at around this time. Noel set up a new label called Big Brother to take over management of Oasis releases and the Oasis back catalogue, so that transition was smooth. But the loss of Alan McGee's influence was a different story entirely. Throughout the 90s, McGee was a stickler for excellence when it came to Oasis releases. He was a rare voice in the world of Noel Gallagher who could say to him, that's not good enough, that needs improving. And throughout the 90s, he did so many times. A great example of this is the making of their first album, Definitely Maybe, which McGee said no to twice. They had to go through three different versions of the album before he was satisfied but it paid off. When we went up to McGee's flat that night and we'd, we'd been mixing Columbia for about, I think it was about the hundredth mix, and we got there and before we, <laughs> before we pressed play on the tape recorder, we said, 
before we start, this is the fucking bollocks. Wait till you hear this. And if if you don't fucking like this, me and him are washing our hands of the album and you're going to have to get somebody else to mix it. And it come on and we sat there and the minute it fucking come on, the pair of us just went, it sounds fucking awful. <laughs> <laughs> it was fucking rubbish. And of course, McGee's like, ah, we're going to have to get someone else to mix it. I said to Noel Gallagher, it's no good enough. I knew what Oasis should sound like because I've seen it live and I just knew that performances were wrong. At one point, he was so frustrated by the whole thing, he went, look, why don't we just put it out and we'll get it right in the second album? And I went, you'll never get to the second album. While the band were already busy working hard out on tour, McGee would tell Noel that they needed to record some new B-sides so that every single the band released in the 90s had the full four tracks as permitted by UK chart rules. Often, while out on tour, Noel, who already had his hands full, had to literally write the new songs and get to the studio to record them. But under that pressure, he seemingly thrived and became a brilliant and prolific songwriting genius. Noel had many areas in which he was absolutely excellent, but Alan McGee kept watch over the areas where he wasn't. And one of those areas was Noel's tendency to say, Fuck it, that'll do. The thing between definitely maybe and uh, be here now was like, I never had any time off, so I was just writing constantly. But this time, after the be here now tour, I didn't write any songs on that tour because I was too busy getting pissed. And uh, so I came back off the tour with nothing, not one single crotchet of music, and then had a year off, and then didn't write anything for a year. So it was then, you know, so, in effect, I hadn't written anything for two years. Now, the thing about songwriting is, it's like anything, it's like riding a bike, you know. You just need the practice. You, you do forget how to do it, you know. You, you know, you've got your little methods of, you know, where do you go when you get stuck for that line? And all songwriters have got their little, you know, their little stack of books that they get out. We all do it. Um, so I'd forgotten how to do that, and it was, it was just a case of that was that was the most daunting thing was writing the first song. Yeah. At least I didn't. At least I haven't got pressure put on me by any record company or anything like that. I'm not, you know, it's never like on this day you must deliver this album or you're in breach of contract or anything. People just let me get on with my thing. You know what I mean? I do come up with the goods. So I just need a bit more. You know, as I'm getting older, I just need a bit more space and time really just to get on with it. When Alan McGee chose to close down Creation and move on. There was seemingly no one left in the Oasis fold with the authority and clout to tell Noel Gallagher that's not good enough anymore. So what followed in the noughties after his departure was an unbroken line of singles that fell short of the high standard of excellence established in the 90s. After McGee left, Oasis never again released a single with the full possible four songs on it. And so, that previous high bar of uncompromising excellence began to slip. And by the time it got to the singles off the last album, of all of them, there was only one new B-side and everything else was just a throwaway remix. I remember how significant and utterly depressing that felt at the time. From the moment Alan McGee left, there was never again a proper Oasis single with four songs on it. Someone, somewhere, was saying, fuck it, that'll do. And that attitude appeared elsewhere as well. The signature sound of Oasis in the 90s was massively down to the skill and craft of producer Owen Morris. But Noel Gallagher had just come out of a drug fueled breakdown and Owen Morris was legendarily mad when it came to chemical abuse. Now, I don't know this for sure, but I suspect that that was perhaps part of the reason that they chose not to record album number four with Owen. A no drugs in the studio policy and Owen Morris don't mix. So it ran out about the time of BA now, we would all get pretty much, pretty loaded and then go and record a record, whereas for this album, we sort of done it the other way around. But I like working like that anyway. I don't like chaos in the studio because I can't concentrate on what it is I'm trying to do, you know. Sure. Sure. Just but, to lay this, sorry. 
But I, I think that the bat, the record sounds better for it anyway. Yeah, Just that I thought we've, I felt we'd come to the end of the relationship with Owen. Really, I didn't think that going in the studio and seeing Owen behind the desk, as much as I love him as a geezer and that, you know, and he's we've done some great stuff together. I would know exactly what I was going to get out of him, and he would know exactly what he was going to get out of me. Whereas with Spike, I'd never met him before. So I was thinking, well, you know, who's this geezer? But, you know, Owen was brilliant for that time. It was the same as Griggs and Bonner, they were great for that time, but, you know... Just, you know, shit's got to change every now and again, you know what I mean? Keep, keep, keep you happy, you know what I mean? And so, instead of the flawed indie genius of Owen Morris, they brought in a pop producer, Spike Stent, the man who had produced the Spice Girls' debut album. Perhaps unsurprisingly, his style was radically different to that of Owen Morris. One of the key features of Owen's style was that he left a massive amount of natural human element in his mixes. And it's my personal belief that this is what made many of those recordings resonate with us and speak to us in a much deeper way than all the rigid programmed dance music of the time. Now, Owen did prefer to record bands with a click track, but what he didn't seem to do was digitally quantize. Now, for those of you who aren't into the production world, quantizing is when you lock every beat and every strum digitally to a timing grid. The overwhelming majority of music today is all quantized so hard that it's got no soul, no heart, no depth. Back then, that wasn't the case. Owen would make small adjustments by hand or by ear, but by and large, he left it really loose. He left it really human. And so the band's recordings in the 90s are just packed full of soul. The same principle applied when it came to auto-tuning the vocals. Owen would only ever very gently nudge the vocals towards the correct note, but he didn't rigidly auto-tune them. Just listen to Noel Gallagher's vocals on Don't Look Back in Anger. He soars over the notes, he comes down to meet it and sometimes goes under it. He's got so much expression. His singing is natural and heartfelt and it speaks to you in a way that auto-tuned stuff just doesn't. It moves you because it's full of human expression. When Owen Morris exited the Oasis fold, from that point on, Oasis music was quantized and auto-tuned. And when that happened, Oasis lost a huge chunk of the heart and soul of their music. Noel's songs were still really good, but somehow they just didn't speak to people in quite the same way anymore. Spike was really good at technically at recording. I mean, that, the, the sounds on that album, on Who Feels Love and Go Let It Out, are brilliant. But the songs are not there, do you know what I mean? It's kind of symptomatic of that record. The sounds are great and the playing's pretty good, and but it's just not, the songs are not there. You know, there's no killer singles on it. But Noel's style in the studio had changed, along with his leadership style. In the 90s, Noel ruled the band with an iron fist. He was in charge, he made all the decisions, he wrote all the songs, he could fine band members, he could fire band members. Everybody called him the chief. He was an absolute dictator in many ways, but weirdly, in the band context, it worked. It meant that pretty much all the songs that were put out were excellent, regardless of anyone in the band feeling a little bit sidelined. In the noughties, however, Noel backed off a little bit and allowed a slightly more democratic element to come in. But when he did so, when the band became a bit more of a committee, it lost its edge. The band were probably happier, but as a result, the music suffered. But I'm proud of it all, apart from the lyrics on I Can See a Liar, which That's are... That's the only other like, critics been really getting Yeah, from. but I mean, I, you know, I, I said that before it came out, so, yeah. you know. I did warn everybody, so, uh, I mean, I'm not saying... I think it's a great song, but it's just, just the lyrics are a bit shit, but, you know, Liam wanted it on the album and I didn't. Uh, I got outvoted in the studio sure. by, by the producer as well as the engineer, so there, but... And so, as less good songs were allowed to come in and 
dilute the Oasis canon a little bit, the high bar of excellence established in the 90s was compromised again a little more. And as a result, many songs that never would have made it onto a creation Oasis release were released under Big Brother. And just to emphasize this point, after Noel left Oasis, the remaining members formed a band called BDI, and that band proved the most important point about the music industry. You can have the fame, you can have the image, you can have the press, you can have the money, you can have the attitude, and you can have the connections. But if you don't have the songs, you will never reach the true top of the mountain. The other really significant loss to the Oasis team was Brian Cannon and the brilliant but expensive Microdot sleeves. I've always felt that the Oasis output in the 90s, with all those geniuses involved in the production, it was a bit like Apple under Steve Jobs. The art, the songs, the packaging, the press, the mix, everything had to be made with excellence, regardless of the cost. Sleeve designer Brian Cannon would have a massive budget for the artwork just for a single, thousands and thousands of pounds, and as a result, his covers were genuine works of art, full of little secret hidden meanings and Easter eggs. Every Microdot Oasis cover was a vast, complex, multi-layered work of art in the 90s, and Creation spent an absolute fortune making them. But that excellence was what set Oasis apart. It was part of the reason that their stuff spoke to us so strongly. A new Oasis release would grab people and fill them with a desire to own it, to possess it, just like Apple products did when Steve Jobs was at the helm. Just look at the Don't Look Back in Anger single cover. It cost multiplied tens of thousands of pounds to produce. Look at the track listing. Four songs, the maximum allowed, the title track, two brilliant original B-sides, and an excellent cover of Come On Feel The Noise. And now, let's contrast that 90s single with a naughty single, Let There Be Love, released not by Creation, but by Big Brother. It only has two B-sides, one of which is a super depressing rip-off of Sexy Sadie that clocks in at less than two minutes long, and a live version of Rock and Roll Star that isn't a patch on the original, in which Liam's vocals are going into their very worst phase. It looks like there's been no effort put into maintaining that brilliance and that excellence that set them apart in the 90s. The cover was famously made when Noel had no ideas, so he pulled his keys out of his pocket and said, do you want to just take a photo of those? When you think about Brian Cannon's sleeves, you just can't get very much further from the effort and thought that was put into the packaging in the 90s. The biggest shock to me in the year 2000, when Standing on the Shoulder of Giants came out, was the very clear change in Liam Gallagher's singing style. He just wasn't singing the same anymore. On some albums like Don't Believe the Truth, there were moments where it sounded like he was trying to do a kind of half imitation of John Lennon, rather than singing with the full-throated emotional power he had sung with in the 90s. But of course, as the noughties progressed, the reason for this became apparent. Liam's voice was starting to break. To be honest with you, I would like to be doing some might say, but Liam just can't sing it anymore. I was, I was about that. <laughs> yeah, well, it's a shame because that's probably the best Oasis song that we've got. That sort of in that four and a half minutes, that's what it is, you know. It's just that probably says more about Oasis than any other song. But um, you know, he just can't. You can't sing the chorus anymore, and it's like, you know, if it means him walking off stage every time he sings it, then it's best just to do Shaker Maker. But if you can't do your job, then you know, it's as simple as that. Because if he can't sing, then the band can't play. But it's all right me taking over and saying, oh, well, I'll, you know, well, I'll do the gig, but it then ceases to become Oasis, doesn't it? Yeah. It then becomes the Noel Gallagher experience. You know, and that's, and that's not what it's all about. A decade of constant smoking, drinking, and drug abuse while singing for hours and hours 
multiple nights in a row, had wrecked his vocal cords. And by the last days of Oasis, in many live recordings, he sounded more like a choking pit bull. And so, as Liam's voice began to struggle, Noel began effectively becoming co-frontman of the band. Just look at the Sunday Morning Call single. Noel sings literally every song on that single. Liam is nowhere to be found. I've always found it quite interesting that during that period, Noel wrote a lot of really good songs that he could have used with Oasis, but he didn't. He ended up using them for his solo career. I wonder if, at this point where he was doing so much of the singing, he realised he was actually ready to front his own outfit. I do, find, I do tend that I find to write more slow pieces of music, which I've now started not to bother recording anymore because I want to keep Oasis like a, you know, a high energy rock and roll band really. Um, but I do find it easier to write slow pieces of music. It's just because I'm, I'm quite a laid back geezer and when you've got an acoustic guitar, I'm not very fucking angry about stuff, you know. Mm. I just tend to be quite plaintive and write songs like that, but... So I've got a lot of slow music knocking about, which I'm not even going to bother exploring. You know, I'll just stick it on a cassette somewhere and I'll probably use it for solo stuff in the future. In the 90s, especially in the first half, Noel was an enthusiastic lead guitarist, sometimes to the point of overkill. The real people, who produced the earliest demos, and Owen Morris, who produced almost everything else in the 90s, all had to battle to get Noel to just tone down the amount of lead guitar soloing he was doing on the tracks. There were famously a ridiculous amount of guitar overdubs on Be Here Now, part of the mission of that album being to fill every available track on two tape machines on every single song. And on the Be Here Now tour, Noel was really becoming an excellent lead guitarist in his own right. In the noughties, however, the bigger, faster, louder, more mindset had given way to less is more, and Noel began to back away from lead guitar, often delegating the playing to new guitarist, Gem. What it's done is, is Gem has taken a lot of the weight off my shoulders because I don't have to play lead guitar all the time, so I can concentrate on singing and playing rhythm guitar a lot more than I would usually do. The main thing to look for is see how many amps I'm not using. You know, on the last tour I was using four Marshall stacks. Yeah. I was using, it was, just, it was just outrageous, you know. I wanted to be Pete Townsend. Whereas now I've got two little tiny amps. And I used to have them sort of like, you know, these big stacks. I used to have them backed up right against my back so I could, you know, so I could feel it. Now I've got two little amps and they're, they're across the side of the stage. I can actually hear what I'm singing now. Noel Gallagher's enthusiasm for playing lead guitar in the band always seemed to go hand in hand with his passion and enthusiasm for the band as a whole. When his vision and dream for Oasis burned the brightest, he worked hard to become a guitar hero. But when it began to fade, he would also step away from playing lead. The less is more philosophy began to bleed into Noel's songwriting as well. He began to move away from songs with a clear beginning, middle and end, songs that could be performed with just voice and acoustic guitar, and began moving towards more groove-based songs. Compare the sweeping textures, the highs and lows of Champagne Supernova in the 90s, to songs like Put Your Money Where Your Mouth Is, or Shock of the Lightning in the noughties. Whereas in the 90s, particularly in the Morning Glory era, the songs were full of dynamics and changes in texture and interesting developments, in the noughties, there became a tendency to just have 
exactly the same arrangement, exactly the same drum beat, exactly the same wall of guitars from start to finish. Noel continued further and further away from his singer-songwriter roots and into groove-based songs until in his solo career he literally reached the point where he was making techno-inspired dance music with programmed beats and synthesizers. Perhaps the biggest thing that really changed, however, was the change in British culture. As British culture moved on, Oasis had the chance to do what many other top acts in the past had had to do, adapt to a changing musical landscape and reinvent themselves. The Beatles did it in the mid-60s, Queen did it in the 80s, even the Arctic Monkeys did it in more recent years. But, for reasons we may never fully understand, Oasis never really managed it. You can, I mean, I, sometimes it gets me down, it's like we were, you can look at this one or two ways, it's like, People say we were really lucky to have a big hit album with Morning Glory, but the way I look at it is like we were really fucking unlucky because we've, like, we've never been able to live that down ever since the day I wrote Wonderwall, man. You know, it's like we sold 12 million albums once, you know, and people should be saying, you know, people should be great that a British band actually came that close to being as big as the fucking Beatles, but what it is, is they just use it as a stick to Beatles with and it fucking gets on my nerves, to be honest with you. People just don't fucking like me anymore. I've done something. <laughs> I've done something and I can't quite work out what it is, but there you go. I don't, I, don't, I don't dig all this bullshit about moving on sonically. We never said we were going to change the world. We never said we were going to, you know, make groundbreaking records. I don't give a fuck about British music or Japanese music or French music or the ongoing, you know, the ongoing fucking uh, challenge, you know, to challenge your listener. Fuck all that, man. I just want to make people dance. You know, I just want to move air, man. I don't care about fucking, you know, sonics and where music's going to be in the next century. I'm not going to be fucking around in the next century. I don't give a shit about that. And when did I ever say I was going to change music anyway? When did I ever say I was going to be this groundbreaking, you know, lyrically adept musician? Yeah. Fucking, I just play the blues, man. Just write bullshit. Sure. Our music will stand the test of time. That is a fact, right? All this media hype and all this thing about us being this, that and the other, right, will be dead in a year's time. Everyone will forgot about it. The records that we make will be in the shops forever and it's as simple as that and on that point I'll be part of the Phoenix Kid. Hoorah! They had lost so many fundamentally important pillars of the Oasis world. Bonehead, Gwigsy, Mark Coyle, Alan McGee, Owen Morris, Brian Cannon. And when these guys left they seemingly never found comparable visionaries to replace them with. I wonder if at this point they had kind of started to believe their own hype. Frequently, instead of bringing in a new set of experts to help them reinvent themselves, they started trying to do everything themselves. There's the new Oasis logo that didn't really catch on. That was designed by Gem. The band themselves produced the album Heathen Chemistry, and in my opinion, that's probably the worst album they ever made. And I suppose the biggest takeaway that any musician can gain from these points is this. It doesn't matter who is in the spotlight. You are not getting to the top without surrounding yourself with the right people and making excellence the top priority in all areas of your craft. But if you can do that, just as Oasis did under McGee in the 90s, there's no limit to the amount of people you can see swept up in the wake of what you create.